from KSAT 12. The news at noon starts right now. New this noon, three teenagers are headed to jail for allegedly robbing a student on his way to school. That robbery happened on Days of Allah Road, only a few blocks away from Clark High School. San Antonio police catching up with the suspects, two girls and an 18 year old woman within minutes. As Katrina Weber reports, their arrests involved a struggle that left one officer hurt. At an hour when others their age are in class, three teenagers are in handcuffs, learning a whole different kind of lesson. They're accused of pulling a knife and robbing a student after eight this morning as he walked along Days of Allah Road on his way to Clark High School. San Antonio police say they ordered that teen to turn over everything he had. Then they tried to run away. The victim went to a bakery nearby to get help. Police went on the hunt for the suspects and quickly found them only a few blocks away. They arrested two 16-year-old girls and an 18-year-old woman. While trying to make these arrests, one of the officers did hurt his knee. Police say he was struggling with one suspect when a second one jumped on his back. A passerby had to help him out by pulling her off of him. The officer's injury, according to police, didn't appear to be serious. The charges against the suspects are, though. Police say they found the knife that was used in the robbery and recovered most of the victim's property but they spent some time looking for one item that's still missing, the victim's cell phone. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Also near this noon, an investigation into a shooting is underway on the northeast side. So far, police aren't sure what sparked it. Police say they, they were called to the 1900 block of Loop 410 yesterday afternoon. That's near Wurzbach at Loop 410. Officers found the 20-year-old victim in front of an apartment with a gunshot to his upper torso. Police say the victim did not give them any information about the shooting and no witnesses have come forward. The victim was taken to the hospital in critical condition. No update on his condition at this hour. It was a mixed decision. The Supreme Court refusing to block the new Texas law that bans abortions after cardiac activity is detected in the fetus. The controversial new law, now the most restrictive in the country, but other states are likely to follow. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott with the latest. The conservative majority has allowed the most restrictive abortion law in the nation to stand. For most women in the nation's second largest state, the right to get an abortion will now be restricted. The Supreme Court breaking its silence overnight in a five to four ruling. They were bitterly divided on this. Chief Justice John Roberts, a conservative, joined the liberal justices in dissenting the move, calling the Texas law not only unusual, but quote, unprecedented. Abortion providers did challenge this, but in an unsigned opinion, the conservative majority said they did not address complex procedural questions. So now the law will be on hold. Women will not be allowed to get an abortion in the state of Texas if a fetal heartbeat is detected, which could be as early as six weeks into a pregnancy and before some women even know that they are pregnant. The court's majority did make clear that they are not weighing in on whether the Texas law is constitutional and they did leave the door open for other legal challenges. But advocates are concerned that what happened here in Texas could be a blueprint and a model for other states. Rachel Scott, ABC News, Austin. Tonight, city leaders are set to provide another live update about the coronavirus pandemic here in San Antonio. So far, cases of coronavirus in our hospitals continue to decrease. A majority of those patients are not vaccinated. And 1,302 people are fighting the virus inside our local hospitals. 18 new COVID-related deaths were confirmed yesterday. The seven-day average increased to about 1,200 new cases a day. You can watch the latest update live right here on KSAT 12 during the News at 6. The COVID-19 pandemic has made history, and each of us have stories and experiences that are an important part of it. Now the Witty Museum is on a mission to collect those stories and include them as part of a permanent collection. Alicia Barrera visited the site of one of the first artifacts that was donated to the Witty as part of what they're calling the Rapid Response Collection. One of the first stories to be included is that of hunger and how one single pantry ignited hope. We're talking about the Jovita Idar pantry in fridge. The original structure is now at the Witty after it was accepted by them. It's at the Witty's B. Naylor Morton Research and Collection Center. The original pantry was put out in front of the founder's home a year ago. They, along with neighbors, stocked it with food, personal hygiene supplies, books, really anything to help the people 
people within their local area. Thanks to the leadership from interns at the museum, the original structure has now been accepted as part of the Whitty Museum's permanent Texas history collection to represent people from all walks of life in San Antonio. But here's the thing, the Whitty needs more stories and they want yours. These are the kinds of stories, um, people from all walks of life, doctors, nurses, um, school teachers, stay at home parents. What was it like to, to, to homeschool your children during the pandemic? These are all relevant stories that seem every day and common now. And our worry is that people will think of them as not worthy of a museum, but they truly are. If you're interested in sharing your story, submitting artifacts, including videos or photos, you can do so by emailing stories at wittymuseum.org. Reporting from the city's west side, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio's Humane Society is helping out some four-legged victims of Hurricane Ida. The animal shelter welcomed more than 100 dogs and cats to its facility overnight. There are 86 cats and 50 dogs in all. The Humane Society is helping out by taking them in, allowing shelters in southern Louisiana to open up more space so they can take in more animals. The hope is those pets that arrived this morning will be here for only a few days. After they're assessed by our medical team and they've been reviewed, we'll be able to get them on adopt, up for adoption early next week. Now, this is the second arrival of animals from Louisiana. They took in 17 animals last Saturday. With more pets to take care of, the Humane Society is in need of some extra supplies. There is a full list of what they could use on their website, sahumane.org. A nasty deluge of rain and tornadoes in New York and New Jersey, devastating homes, all of it the remnants of Hurricane Ida. Record rain causing major flooding, killing more than a dozen people. ABC's Dan Lieberman with the amazing images. People waking up to news of at least 13 fatalities across New York State and New Jersey, at least eight in New York City. As historic floods ripped through the region overnight, the remnants from Hurricane Ida merging with a front to produce a first time ever flash flood emergency for all five boroughs of the city. We saw a horrifying storm last night, unlike anything we have seen before. In Queens, two dead from a partial building collapse, three others found in a flooded home, including a two-year-old boy, and images flooding in from underground of biblical proportion. Water gushing out of a wall at one Manhattan subway station and pouring down station stairs. The entire New York City subway system forced to shut down, along with Newark Airport in New Jersey, both now reopened with limited service. Above ground, a bus passenger standing on his seat to avoid the water. Stranded cars and water rescues. FDNY members rescuing someone who has been trapped in that Jeep for now well over an hour. And in New Jersey, at least 25 homes in Mullica Hill destroyed after a possible tornado struck. Some homes pulverized by the storm. See branches start to get carried by the wind past my house. The, the chair on our front porch got flipped and it was, it was nuts. In this morning in Passaic, New Jersey, divers searching for people who may have been swept away by seven foot high floodwaters. This image taken from a bridge heading into Pennsylvania, showing a possible tornado. With dramatic scenes of boat rescues happening today in Philadelphia. Speaking of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia officials are warning that the Schuylkill River, creeks and streams are at risk of flooding over the next 24 hours. Officials across the region warning people to pay attention to road closures and signs because it's still dangerous out there. Dan Lieberman, ABC News, Central Park, New York. Still coming up in a few minutes, Thursday night college football. UIW kicking off their season night. Lear Mears with a preview as they get ready for the Youngstown State Penguins. From an Apple computer to Yeezy sneakers, there's a plenty of items that are for sale during SAPD's latest auction when it's all going to be going on sale after the break. If you're looking to score a great deal on some pricey items, the San Antonio Police Department might have just what you need. Today, it's holding another auction. The department will sell off items they've seized this time around. You can find everything from Jordan sneakers to Spurs collectors memorabilia. There's even computers and some gold jewelry. And what else are they selling? 
you name it. We have tools, we have electronics, have ladders, uh, TVs, you name it. Uh, only thing obviously we don't have here today are vehicles. We just did a vehicle auction a couple days ago. That auction is going to be held at 6.30 tonight at the VFW located at 650 East White. That's near Roosevelt Avenue on the south side. Bidders can start viewing the items starting at 5.30 this evening. It's amazing, but some of that stuff is like brand new. I, know. I mean, it's like fresh out of the box. Good deals. Right good there. deals Speaking and a good, good deal of heat uh, and humidity today. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, look, we just popped up to 90. Oh, wow. Oh, oh nice. Hey. So nice. <laughs> Couldn't stay at 89 for just a little longer. Already up to 90. It is going to be another hot day and the summertime heat is going to be a trend that continues all the way into the upcoming holiday weekend and we'll take a sneak peek at your Labor Day forecast coming up here in just a couple of minutes but first the aquifer today is down a little bit more than half a foot and in your pollen count pretty busy again leading the pack is fall elm with a moderate count of 130 molds pigweed and ragweed are all low on this Thursday we'll be right back Yeah, it's humid out there. Is yeah. it still 90? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I've been told that for Friday Night Football, David is not going to be wearing a full suit, and that's no, probably no. a really good idea. No, no. That is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, it is going to be really warm and muggy these next couple of evenings kicking off the football season. We know start of football season around here. Uh, chances are it is going to be warm. We do have some low end rain chances to talk about. That's something to keep in the back of your mind if you've got some games to go to the next couple of evening. Let's first start off with another look um, at that flooding, that historic and deadly flooding that took place across parts of the Northeast. Uh, look at all these icons. These are all storm reports, so um, especially heavy rain and flood reports all the way up from D.C., Washington, D.C., there at the bottom of your screen. And then there's Boston, so this encompasses a good part of the Northeast and even parts of New England. Big swath of flooding, heavy rains reported all the way from Baltimore there up to Boston. Uh, Boston, that 1.69 inches of rain there was not a daily record, but everywhere else, Hartford, uh, Newark, down to Philly and Baltimore, those were all record daily rainfall totals. Um, and look at that, nearly nine inches of rain in one day uh, for Newark there near New York City. Um, these intense heavy rainfall events you may have seen this graphic around on social media, especially on Twitter. This comes courtesy of Climate Central, um, and this shows that uh, downpours or heavy precipitation events or the top 1% of rain events are becoming more frequent. This was the percentage change between 1958 and 2016. And in parts of New England and the Northeast, these heaviest precipitation events, so the flooding historic events, those increased from 1958 to 2016 by 55%. Here in Texas, those types of events increased by 12%. The reason for that is as our atmosphere warms, it can hold more water vapor and that results in heavier rain, which can lead to those historic and heavy rainfall events. So just a little bit of perspective there here at home, partly cloudy at the airport, still reading 89, David, but we're hovering very close to 90. Our dew point is in the low 70s. Not much of a breeze quite yet. I do think we'll see our wind speeds pick up um, to closer to 10 to 15 miles per hour this afternoon and this evening. So that breeze will help us out just a touch. But uh, either way you slice it, it's going to be a hot day with high temperatures jumping back very close to 100 this afternoon uh, with humidity staying elevated today. Our heat indices will likely peak closer to 105 during the hottest part of the day today, even though our air temperature is in the upper 90s. So uh, watch those heat indices this afternoon. You'll notice as we get into the holiday weekend, Saturday, Sunday and Monday, there's not as much of a spread between our air temperatures in our feels like temperatures or the heat index. That's because we're going to catch a little break this weekend, especially by Sunday as our afternoon dew points come down just a bit. That will help us out with the humidity, but that could be the extra nudge we need to get our actual air temperature to that century mark. We have yet to hit 100. We got up to 99 yesterday, so we're getting very close there and we'll have to see how the next few days play out. But uh, we could certainly see our first triple digit day here in San Antonio as we get into the holiday weekend. So feeling like 96 now over in Gonzales, already feeling like 102, feeling like 105 in Pleasanton. So it's plenty steamy out there already. 
Only way you're going to cool off this afternoon is if you find yourself under a little bit of rain and the best chance for that will be well east of I-35 through this afternoon from Howlettsville, Lavaca County, uh, even down to Quero. There have been a couple of small showers out there, but a lot of the activity this afternoon will stay uh, generally east of a Howlettsville down to Victoria line off closer to the Houston area. Nonetheless, a stray shower east of 35, not out of the question today. So if you have a football game to head to this evening, just know it is going to be hot out there. Yes, a stray storm east of 35, but most of us are just dealing with heat this evening. Quick check of the tropics for you. I'm so glad Larry is in the studio because we have Hurricane Larry out in the middle of the Atlantic. Yeah, uh, told me yesterday. <laughs> this should mainly be uh, what we would call a fish storm, at least for the next five days or so. No offense, Larry. That's not. Uh, That's not. It's not personal. Am, am I delivering fish or something? No, 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 no. no. Um, <laughs> there's also a little disturbance coming off of Africa, a little closer to home. Another disturbance that has low odds of development down in the Caribbean. So really, the only organized tropical activity is Hurricane Larry. So there you yeah. go. It's your time to shine. All right. Coming up at our next half hour, we'll explain what a fish storm is. <laughs> yes. Hey, on that field goal graphic, does it ever miss wide left or wide right? Never. Oh, okay. I've never seen him miss. Well, I asked Justin if he could move it back to like the 50 just to give it a little, you know, <laughs> more excitement to it, see if we might miss, but no. All right, well, uh, NFL teams did the sign up our weather team because they know how to kick field goals, yeah, that's for sure. Hey, the Dallas Cowboys are now one week away from their season opener. The big question is, how is Dak's throwing shoulder plus Deshaun Watson? Yes, is still with the Houston Texans. Coming up. It's going to be my uh, first uh, long trip of my college career, and I'm excited to you know, just get out there playing and uh, play Youngstown State. Cameron Ward and the Cardinals of Incarnate Word are now in Youngstown, Ohio, to play football tonight in Big Board Sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys picked up quarterback Will Greyer off of waivers. That's after the Carolina Panthers decided to release Greyer, their third-round draft pick in 2019. Now, during his weekly radio show in Dallas, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones was asked to give us an update on QB1 Dak Prescott as he recovers from an injury to his throwing shoulder with the season opener now just one week away. Very encouraging. Uh, from my viewpoint, uh, he's uh, uh, moving good. He's uh, uh, really uh, got that zip on the ball. Uh, we uh, uh, know that he's been throwing with his key receivers uh, for a few days uh, out there, the last few practices. And so, uh, uh, frankly, uh, as far as him uh, being able to execute and execute the throws and uh, uh, move around the way he should against Tampa. Uh, I don't have any concern at all about that. There you go. One week from tonight, the Cowboys will open the 2021 season at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. When the Houston Texans announced their cuts, among the surprises was wide receiver Kiki QT, who was thought to have a shot at a breakout season after battling injuries previously and after the Texans traded Randall Cobb back to Green Bay. Now, quarterback Deshaun Watson remains on the Texans roster, if for no other reason than trade bait in the future. His successor, Tyrod Taylor, was asked if he's surprised he's still there. I've said from day one uh, that, that Deshaun is, is, is a part of this team um, and will continue to handle business according, accordingly. Um, like I said, he's, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. I mean, he's a teammate of mine, and uh, we're all in it to to put our best foot forward and to do whatever it takes to, to help the team win. And um, we'll all do our part uh, to make sure that everyone's uh, on board. Houston will kick off the season Sunday the 12th at home with the Jacksonville Jaguars. In college football, Incarnate Word is now in Youngstown, Ohio to play Youngstown State tonight. The Cardinals are all about the word finish this season, which they didn't do at all in the spring when they started 3-0, only to lose their final three games to finish 3-3. Quarterback Cameron Ward, who tore it up last season with 2,200 yards passing and 24 touchdowns, is ready to lead the Cardinals to a fantastic season. Well, I'm excited uh, for this year. Last year I had a, a lot of mistakes that I made. Uh, I learned from them. Me and my quarterback coach, Coach Leftwich, were working every day in the film room, uh, watching the practice film from even from uh, last year and after this practice. So just working every day to get to our uh, – try to win a conference championship and uh, make a deep run in the playoffs. 
Cardinals and Penguins tonight at <laughs> 6 from Stambaugh Stadium in Youngstown, Ohio. David, I knew you would like that mascot name. I do. Penguins. I like that. That's pretty good. Good luck to them. Hey, they're coming up, uh, you know, spring football. Yep. So they should be a little more tuned up than some. Ready to go. Ready. A series of mysterious knocks and thumps in the night, startling one couple in South Carolina. They thought it might be a burglar, but when they went to investigate, it turned out to be far more frightening. Details in the next half hour. And the remnants of Ida made their way to the eastern states. However, in Louisiana, folks still picking up the pieces after getting slammed by that storm. And they're trying to pick up supplies as well, but they're running into issues. Details coming up after the break. Hurricane Ida is now long gone from the Gulf Coast, but the mess that it left behind will linger on for weeks or months to come. Power poles are down, electricity out, the flooded homes are quickly becoming molded over in the humid heat. And that's not all. ABC's Matt Gutman shows us people in New Orleans are having to wait in some very long lines to get gasoline for their generators and cars. A fifth day is dawning without power here in these parts of Louisiana. And people are growing increasingly desperate for food, for water, but above all, for fuel. We're at a gas station in Laplace. It was pummeled by the storm. And you might be able to see that woman in the silver car behind me. She has a seven-month-old infant. She was here at 2 a.m., the first in line to get gas. And with our drone, I want you to see this line of cars snaking all the way to Horizon. All those people defied curfew orders because they are so desperate for fuel, especially for generators and for people whose family members are reliant on medical devices, keeping those generators going, they told me, is a matter of life and death. And EMS officials here reporting that call volume for them has risen 185%, and that is partly due to carbon monoxide poisonings. And just in New Orleans, we heard yesterday that 12 people were hospitalized, including seven children for that. Now, the lights have started to flicker on, particularly in the French Quarter in New Orleans, but that's only 3% of the power transmission for this area. And, you know, there are forests of power poles down. Power lines, if you stretch them out, would reach from here all the way to Russia. And the scale of the damage to infrastructure here is a major reason that President Biden is going to visit here tomorrow. This storm is estimated to have cost this area tens of billions of dollars. Matt Gutman, ABC News, Laplace, Louisiana. All right, let's get outside. Live cam, it's already 90 degrees or, well, it's right there teetering between 89 and 90. We've seen 89, we've seen 90. Yeah, okay, really imagine nice. you don't have electricity. Oh, no. And you're that's having to open your windows in 90% that's, humidity. Yeah, that's the you gotta thing. feel for those folks down in New Orleans. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Just miserable conditions there, and I do hope that power can get restored as quickly as possible. But that is a that is a 24-7 full-time job trying to get that power back in place. So uh, I don't know about you, but I'll be extra thankful for this AC that we have here inside this afternoon. High temperatures yesterday. Yesterday was actually our hottest day here in San Antonio so far. We had gotten up to 98 a few times, but yesterday was the first time that we reached 99 at the airport. We have yet to see 100 degrees this summer, uh, but some places like Del Rio, especially west of 35, uh, you guys have uh, seen 100 several times, but uh, not at the airport just yet. I do expect we're going to get very close this weekend, especially likely Saturday, Sunday afternoons. Our air temperatures will be in the upper 90s. Our dew points will drop off more as we get into the weekend, especially on Sunday. That could be the day that we see that little boost up to the century mark. Again, when you step outside, though, if it's 99 or 100, you're really not going to notice a whole lot of difference. Uh, but of course, uh, it's kind of just a mental thing at this point, right? Oh, uh, we've made it this far without seeing 100. We'll see if we can get through the upcoming Labor Day weekend. Monday, Labor Day itself, that's when we'll uh, reintroduce a low chance of rain, mainly later on in the day. And we'll talk more about that coming up here in just a bit. For now, hovering very close to 90 at the airport, but we'll jump into the upper 90s this afternoon, going right around 98 today. Very, very low chance of rain this afternoon. Best chances will be well east of the I-35 corridor, places like Hallettsville over in 
Lavaco, uh, Lavaca County, excuse me, and down toward Cuero. Uh, we'll take a look at radar coming up very shortly. Get your full forecast heading into the Labor Day weekend coming up in a bit. David. Thank you, Katie. Three officers and two paramedics now charged with the death of Elijah McLean in 2019. He died after being put in a chokehold while walking home from a convenience store in Colorado. The grand jury indictment details the 32 counts levied against the officers and first responders. The charges include manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide. I've been praying for all of it. Um, it's what I wanted. My son fought for his life and dead for his life. Police say back on August 24th in 2019, Aurora police officers responded to a 911 call about a masked man acting suspiciously. Officers ended up putting McLean in a chokehold and paramedics injected him with ketamine. That's a powerful anesthetic. The officers later claimed that the 23 year old had reached for one of their guns. Since then, Colorado has banned the use of chokeholds and bar paramedics from using ketamine to subdue suspects. House Democrats have promoted Republican Representative Liz Cheney to vice chairwoman of the committee investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Democrats placed her in a leadership position on that panel today, just as some members of the GOP caucus were threatening to oust her for participating. Cheney is a fierce critic of former President Donald Trump. Cheney has insisted Congress must investigate the Capitol attack in which hundreds of Trump supporters violently pushed past police, broke into the building, and interrupted the certification process of Joe Biden's presidential election victory. The number of Americans seeking unemployment benefits fell last week to 340,000. That's a pandemic low, and it's another sign that the job market is steadily rebounding. I was claims dropped by 14,000 vaccinations for COVID-19 have been supporting the job market by encouraging businesses to reopen or expand hours and consumers to return to restaurants, bars and shops. In response, employers across the country have been trying to hire more people. Traditionally, each wedding anniversary is associated with some type of gift. And according to Hallmark, your 13th anniversary is lace. But one South Carolina couple went a different route. How a six foot alligator crept into their anniversary celebration still ahead. And another big Thursday night for high school football. Larry Mears is going to break down some of the big matchups coming up in sports. A lawman in Alabama is a dead ringer for the famous pro wrestler The Rock. Well, now the famous actor is responding to posts that compare the two men. What he has to say about his look alike after the break. They look at me and they're like, my goodness, you're the rock. He might be looking and saying, that guy don't look like me. I'm a lot better looking than that guy, you know. I remember earlier this week, we introduced you to the Alabama Patrol Lieutenant Eric Fields. He often gets mistaken for Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the famous actor and wrestler. Even The Rock himself had to do a double take. He actually posted on Twitter after seeing a tweet from the Bleacher Report. Johnson gave his double ganger a shout out and thanked him for his service and asked him to stay safe and he says maybe one day the pair will get together and share stories over glasses of tequila gosh they do look alike yeah, wow good. all right your first wedding anniversary is the paper anniversary so couples often get each other paper gifts but what if you're celebrating your 13th year of marriage for one south carolina couple it's the alligator anniversary since they found one in their garage the night they were celebrating the milestone as abc's will gans reports he's got to look at the gator and the couple's fight to free him julie and jeff lindbergh were supposed to be celebrating their 13th anniversary with a quiet night in is finally getting to watch tv without the kids and we hear like this loud crash thump the kids in bed where they were supposed to be. Jeff and Julie deciding to check the garage. But the garage door is open and normally we shut it for the night, but for whatever reason, our sensor, it didn't shut. Their night quickly starting to feel like a real life horror movie. Then I saw a foot off of it, or what I thought was a foot. So I took a step back and questioned myself. <gasps> oh my God. A six and a half foot garage crashing gator. Oh my God, what do we do? Alligators aren't unheard of in Summers Corner, South Carolina. So we see small ones, like two, three foot alligators everywhere, but. Uh, not nearby not, though. And certainly not in the garage. I'm filming it. Oh my God. 
With no access to after-hours animal control, Jeff trying for nearly an hour to scare the gator out of the garage, throwing shoes and yelling. Jeff was like, okay, we need more help than a shoe. <laughs> Finally, a neighbor came over with a huge broom. We got up to bite the stick and then we drug it out and we pushed it down the street. The couple's quiet anniversary night on the couch. I have no clue what we were watching. A uh, good, good girl. Turning into a night to remember. You didn't finish it and it didn't make <laughs> much of an impact considering everything else that happened. I could yeah. not even go to sleep. My adrenaline was so worked up. I kept laying in the bed and every time Jeff would try to fall asleep, I would hit him and I would say there was an alligator in our garage. The couple contacted their HOA, who are working with local authorities to track and remove the gator. Jeff and Julie's kids, though, were thrilled that a big piece of moss fell off of its leg, which they're now showing to all their friends, of course. Will Gans, ABC News, New York. That's the perfect anniversary <laughs> gift, an alligator belt or a pair of boots. Who oh, knew? Gosh. That's, yep, they'll never forget it. I like the fact that they got it out of the garage and just let it go. It's like, well, that's somebody else's problem now. That alligator could roam the neighborhood. <laughs> So a broom is what you need. If anyone Apparently. ever runs into that, just a broom. No big deal. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Uh, back here at home, the aquifer today continues to tumble. Our daily level 659.4 is now below the monthly average. And remember, stage one watering restrictions are in effect for SAWS customers. Today's pollen count, uh, molds are low, pigweed, ragweed low as well. Fall Elm actually leads the pack today. It's moderate with a count of 130. We'll talk more about your forecast for the next couple of days and your Labor Day forecast coming up. Oh, it went up to 91? Well, it seems <laughs> to be our trend. We are heading into the afternoon, so. And you had like four four allergens on her on her sheet? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. she does. People are sniffing. I'm yeah. Disgusting this morning. Yeah, fall elm. Like sniffling, sniffling and sneezing. Fall elm? Fall elm. Already? That's the one that mm -hmm. appeared today? Yes, that's moderate today. Go. Everything else is low, so that, that may be a reason why you're not feeling so great. My eyes were a little itchy um, myself. So last half hour, a lot of discussion about Hurricane Larry. Uh, I called Hurricane Larry a fish storm, and I want to kind of clarify what that is in case you're not sure. First, starting off with a look at uh, tropical climatology for the Atlantic Basin. If you've been thinking lately, especially with Ida and everything going on, uh, it's uh, busy out there. We're hearing a lot about these named storms. Well, this is the time of year, specifically the time of hurricane season where activity peaks, uh, climatologically speaking. In fact, it's right around September 10th, where historically we've seen our highest number um, of hurricanes and tropical storms out in the Atlantic Basin. So it makes sense that things are pretty busy uh, this time of year. Uh, through the central Atlantic into the Caribbean, things are pretty quiet, but we do have Hurricane Larry here right in the middle of the open Atlantic. It's expected to intensify, potentially becoming a major hurricane category four status over the next few days, but it stays over open water. That's why we call it a fish storm. No interaction with land is expected, at least over the next five days. Uh, right on Larry's heels, there is a disturbance that the Hurricane Center gives about a 30% chance of becoming our next tropical depression in the next five days. And even lower odds for this mess of cloud cover and rain to become our next tropical depression in the next five days, just a 20% chance there. This will wander across the Yucatan uh, into the far southern Gulf of Mexico, Bay of Campeche. Over the next five days or so, we'll keep an eye on that for you. But right now, uh, no impacts uh, or no threats to the Gulf of Mexico as far as the tropics go at this time. Satellite and radar does show some rain east of San Antonio off closer to the Houston area. Um, mid upper levels of the atmosphere. We do have a ridge of high pressure that's centered off to our northeast, and that's going to hang pretty close to us over the next several days, especially as we get into the weekend. Saturday into Sunday, it drops farther south, and that's why even the low chance of rain we have in the forecast today and tomorrow will drop out completely Saturday into Sunday. By Monday, though, especially later in the day on Monday, it looks like there's going to be a weak frontal boundary trying to drop into North Texas. That could produce some late day rain for us here in South and Central Texas. So coverage will be very low and it does look like anything that pops up Monday Labor Day would be in the evening hours, potentially even overnight. So if you've got outdoor plans for the upcoming holiday weekend, you're going to be in good shape, but it will be quite hot. And as I've mentioned, we could see our first triple digit day here in San Antonio. Uh, 
maybe even before the holiday weekend gets here. It's going to be very close. 90 the air temperature in New Braunfels feeling like 99. We're going to have heat index readings. The yellow numbers here above 100 likely peaking around 105 here in San Antonio this afternoon, so it will be hot out there. Rain chances are going to be very slim coverage wise, really just about a 10% chance. And again, the best chance will be essentially from Hallettsville down to Victoria and then points east. So that really even gets out of our area and that's closer to the Houston area. Uh, but places like Hallettsville, maybe even Gonzales down to Nixon and Quero uh, could see a stray passing shower as we get into the late afternoon, early evening hours. We'll have to see how much westward progress they can make. I don't think they're going to make very uh, much. So if there's any uh, games you're going to this evening, mainly just hot as we get into Friday afternoon, uh, more spotty showers will be possible east of the uh, I-35 corridor. Again, most of us missing out on rain over the next couple of days. Um, that lower humidity this weekend is actually what could boost us up to 100 as we get into Saturday Ooh. and Sunday, so it's not going to provide a whole lot of relief, unfortunately. Guys, well, my money is on no triple digits this weekend. Okay, place I'll your bets be, over here. That'll be a good deal. <laughs> Positive. Yeah, look, she's like, <laughs> she'll take that bet. <laughs> Bring it over here. Well, my money's on some good football tonight, tomorrow night, and Saturday night, high school wise. And uh, college football as well. I mean, Texas you, Tech starts Saturday. I knew you were going there. Thank you. I just absolutely knew we're it. We're in the tie. He's yes, ready. he is. So anyway, I'm talking about UTSA <laughs> football playing a oh. Big Ten opponent for the first time in school history when they take on Illinois Saturday night. And UTSA women's soccer is off to a record start. They are red hot coming up. KSAT 12, MeTV, Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week will feature the Brandeis Broncos against the Warren Warriors tonight. This will be our second live broadcast of high school football in San Antonio on our 12.2 over the air channel. The Broncos are coming off a lopsided 33-7 win against neighborhood rival O'Connor last week. That's after their game last year was called off due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Meantime, the Warren Warriors lost to the fifth-ranked Smithson Valley Rangers 32-13 in week one, but for facing Brandeis this week in a non-district game. What's important about facing them is that we just execute what we want to do and that they're a pretty good team. Their running back is pretty good. We have to shut him down. Just keeping these kids positive, you know, through these first three games and understanding what it means, I think is the most important thing. And, and uh, you know, our coaches have done a great job of staying positive with our kids and we're going to continue. Uh, we got a great team and, you know, I look forward to continuing to watch them grow. Kickoff between Brandeis and Warren tonight is slated for seven at Gustafson Stadium, and you can see it live on KSAT 12's Me TV, thanks to Texas Sports Productions. And don't forget to join us on our Big Game coverage app this week for live broadcasts of Texas high school football games in and around San Antonio, courtesy of Texas Sports Productions. This week it will include games such as Judson versus Lake Travis, live from Austin. For the first time ever, the UTSA Roadrunners will face a Big Ten team when they play the Illinois Fight in Illini Saturday night. As many as nine Roadrunners are on preseason watch lists, including starting quarterback Frank Harris, running back Sincere McCormick, and safety Rashad Wisdom, along with kicker Hunter Duplessis. The Roadrunners also boast 12 super seniors who were granted an extra year of eligibility due to COVID-19 and will help UTSA try to win their ninth season opener. They feel they have the guys and the toughness to do it. The triangle is going to travel, and the expectation is very high. Say high, we you know we expected of ourselves last year's last year, but we held ourselves to a higher standard at the end of it all. Um, I believe that you know uh, coming into this game, our, uh, we're coming out with our hairs on fire. So I think that it's going to be a great game, and you know overall we're going to have a great competition. Kickoff in Illinois is set for 6.30 p.m. Saturday, and the game will be carried live on the Big Ten Network. Staying with UTSA, the women's soccer team is on fire right now. Last night, Kendall Closa, seen here, netted her second goal this season in the 32nd minute, leading UTSA soccer to a 1-0 win at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, the fourth straight win for the Roadrunners this season. They're now 4-1-0, the best start in program history. Conference USA goalkeeper of the week, Jill Schneider, earned her third clean sheet of the season. UTSA will play at Texas Tech Sunday night at 7. And last night in USL Championship Soccer, San Antonio FC beat Real Monarchs SLC 3-2 at Toyota Field. Club's sixth win in their last eight matches. And how about this? SAFC goalkeeper Matthew Cardoni became the second player in club history to reach 100 appearances in all competitions. From San Antonio, right? Yes.
MacArthur? Pretty darn cool. Wow, that's awesome. Good for him. Yep. And I like to see UTSA ex expand their greatness into all different kinds of sports. Their athletics definitely, I feel, trending up. Yeah, well, they got that new facility over there. <laughs> yeah, right. Of course, they are playing Texas Tech Saturday, so even in soccer. Right. Oh. Go UTSA. <laughs> Fun finds, water activities for Labor Day weekend, and maybe even a little hot chocolate. Mm. Fiona and Jen, what's on tap today? I tell you, yes, we are getting you ready for some family fun this holiday weekend with some water games, fun finds, and even some birthday freebies. So we are going to be showing you some inexpensive ways <laughs> to cool off. Ooh, you're lucky that <laughs> wasn't full. We're having some fun. Also, September is such a busy birthday month. Well, if you were born in September, there's lots of birthday freebies you can take advantage of. We have those local deals. And we are learning to make traditional milk, uh, traditional Mexican chocolate on today's show. So Tyler Barra, owner of Cafe Azteca, joins us. Now there's a little bit of a twist, yeah. right? So it's got the same ingredient that you use to make the mice. Okay. Which Ooh. Is yes. Okay. Super excited. And speaking of coffee, that thing makes me think of fall. We have your five fun finds, and that includes a place that you can go enjoy a Texas maze this weekend already. Maybe that'll help make it feel more like fall. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yes, and also we are doing, oh, yeah, there, there we go, there we go. There Margarita we go. or Pina Colada, we want to know which one is your go-to. You know, it's National World Coconut Day. Which one's yours, Fiona? We'll I think gotta about tell it. you, think about it. I Let like us both. know at SA Live Case out on Facebook and Twitter. Mm. And we'll have all that and more when SA Live continues in just a few minutes.